Today's mindful moment. Packed with insights, but designed to fit into your busy life. One deep dive at a time. Imagine if a single number could define your worth, your potential, your entire being. It sounds uh, pretty unsettling, right? It does. And this idea that intelligence can be boiled down to one fixed score has a really long and often, frankly, troubled history. That's what we're getting into today. How attempts to measure intelligence like this as just one thing have shaped how we see human differences. Exactly. We'll be looking at concepts like G, general intelligence factor analysis, and the whole hereditarian view of IQ, mostly through the lens of Stephen Jay Gould's work, The Mismeasure of Man. Okay. Our mission really is to unpack these complex ideas, look at the assumptions, the biases, and help understand why ranking people by some supposed innate mental worth is, well, deeply flawed. So let's start at the beginning, or close to it. Charles Spearman and his G-factor. What was that all about? Right, Spearman. He was a psychologist in the early 20th century. He noticed that people who did well on one type of mental test tended to do well on others too, verbal, spatial, mathematical, whatever. Okay, that makes sense. So he used a statistical technique called factor analysis, um, specifically something called the method of tetrad differences. He argued that these positive correlations across different tests all pointed towards a single underlying factor. He, G. G, exactly. General intelligence. He thought of it as a kind of core mental energy that powered all cognitive abilities. So the idea was that IQ tests were basically measuring this G, tapping into that fundamental thing. Precisely. That became the theoretical justification. If G is real and underlies all intelligence, then a good IQ test should measure it. Good talks about the reification of G. What's that mean in this context? Reification. Yeah. Yeah. It's a key concept. It means taking something abstract, like a statistical correlation or a factor derived from analysis, and treating it as if it's a concrete physical thing. Ah, okay. So with G, it's mistaking this mathematical pattern for a real entity inside the brain, something tangible that determines how smart you are, like... Uh, thinking the average temperature is a physical object instead of a calculated value. Got it. And Spearman believed this G was mostly inherited. Yes, he did. He was quite clear that he thought G was largely hereditary. This view uh, lay a lot of groundwork for later hereditarian arguments about intelligence. Which brings us neatly to Cyril Burt. He really ran with the hereditarian idea, didn't he? Oh, absolutely. Burt was a very influential British psychologist, and he was a staunch hereditarian. He believed intelligence was overwhelmingly determined by genes. What was his evidence? Or what did he claim as evidence? His most famous work involved studies of identical twins, particularly those supposedly raised apart. He argued the high correlation in their IQ scores, even with different environments, was proof of genetic destiny. Right, the twin studies. Yeah, but sure. his work is, well, it's more than controversial now, isn't it? Extremely. Initially, people questioned his interpretations, but later on, serious accusations arose about data inconsistencies, errors, even outright fabrication. It's a huge scandal in the history of psychology. But even setting aside potential fraud, Gould focused on the conceptual flaws too, right? Yes. Gould argued that even taking Burt's early data at face value, the conclusions about near-total innateness were questionable. The way environments were assessed, or rather not assessed properly, was a major issue. How did Bert connect his ideas back to Spearman's G? Bert fully embraced G. He actually extended Spearman's model, proposing a hierarchy with G at the very top, right. governing broader factors like verbal ability, which in turn governed even more specific skills. It reinforced this idea of a single ladder of intelligence. And did Bert also reify these factors, treat them as real things? Very much so. He saw G and the other factors not just as statistical conveniences, but as actual psychological structures. And this wasn't just academic theory. It had real-world consequences, especially in Britain. Absolutely. Burt's ideas were hugely influential in the development and justification of the 11-plus examination system in Britain. Explain that a bit. The 11-plus was a test given to children around age 11, based largely on the idea of measuring innate intelligence, Jinnosh. It sorted children into different types of secondary schools academic grammar schools for the supposedly bright, and other schools for the rest. Wow. So based on this one test, influenced by these hereditarian ideas. A child's educational path and arguably their life chances were significantly determined. It was a system built on the belief that you could measure innate potential and sort people accordingly. 
Which is precisely the idea Gould attacks head on. What's his central argument against measuring intelligence as a single number? Gould's core argument is that intelligence is far too complex, multifaceted, and influenced by context to be meaningfully captured by a single number or ranked on a linear scale. He saw it as a dangerous oversimplification. And he used an internalist approach, you mentioned. What does that mean? It means instead of just dismissing the old studies, Gould went back into their data. He reanalyzed the original measurements and calculations of people like Morton, Broca, Goddard, Yerkes. His goal was to show, using their own numbers, how unconscious bias, methodological errors, and faulty logic led to their conclusions. He wasn't just saying they were wrong. He was showing how they were wrong from the inside out. Can you give an example, maybe with Morton? Sure. Samuel George Morton in the 19th century collected skulls and measured their cranial capacity, trying to link brain size to race and intellect. Gould remeasured some skulls and recalculated Morton's averages, finding subtle but systematic biases like packing seeds more tightly into Caucasian skulls that skewed the results towards Morton's preconceived notions of racial hierarchy. So the bias was baked into the very measurements. Exactly. And similarly with Goddard's study of the Kalakak family, which supposedly proved the inheritance of feeble-mindedness, Gould pointed out doctored photographs used to make the degenerate side look more menacing and the complete lack of consideration for environmental factors like poverty and lack of education. And the army tests during World War I. Right. Robert Yerkes led the development of the army alpha and beta tests. Gould highlighted massive problems. The tests were culturally biased, administered inconsistently, often under chaotic conditions. Non-English speakers, or recent immigrants, unsurprisingly, scored very poorly on tests riddled with American culture and language. But the results were still used to argue for inherent differences. Yes, tragically. The low scores of certain immigrant groups were interpreted by many, including Yerkes initially, as evidence of innate intellectual inferiority fueling arguments for restrictive immigration quotas. Good also talks about a category mistake. How does that apply here? The category mistake is um, confusing the causes of variation within a group with the causes of differences between groups. For example, we know height is heritable within families. But if one group is systematically malnourished, the average height difference between that group and a well-nourished group isn't primarily genetic, it's environmental. I see. Applied to IQ, even if IQ scores show some heritability within a population group, you can't automatically assume that average IQ differences between groups are primarily genetic. You're mistaking the type of cause. It sounds like understanding the statistics, like factor analysis, is crucial but also really difficult for most people. It really is. Factor analysis is mathematically complex, and multivariate thinking doesn't come naturally. This difficulty makes it easier for seemingly sophisticated statistical arguments about things like G to gain acceptance without deep scrutiny. And factor analysis itself, it's just a mathematical tool, right? Not a window into reality. Correct. It's a method for reducing complex data, for finding patterns of correlation. But the factors it spits out don't automatically correspond to real underlying things. Good uses the analogy you could correlate, say, my age, the price of gas in Ecuador, and my dog's weight over time. Factor analysis might find a strong factor linking them, but it doesn't mean there's a real causal entity connecting those three things. So correlation still doesn't equal causation. Never more so than here. Just because test scores correlate doesn't prove a single thing called G causes them to correlate. You need much more evidence than just the statistical pattern itself. And that's related to the error of reification again. Yes, it's the specific error within factor analysis of assuming that any strong factor or component that emerges from the math must represent something real and meaningful in the world being studied. It's awarding physical meaning where it might not exist. And Gould's final point on G was that it wasn't even the only way to interpret the data. Exactly. He emphasized that Spearman's G is just one possible mathematical solution out of potentially infinite equivalent ways to represent the correlations between tests. It's not some objective truth forced by the data. It's one interpretation chosen by the analyst. The social and political implications of these hereditarian theories, they're pretty chilling. Deeply chilling. These ideas about innate, measurable, and ranked intelligence were readily used to justify existing social inequalities, racism, and prejudice. They provided a seemingly scientific basis for discrimination. You see parallels with scientific racism and eugenics. Absolutely. The desire to quantify and rank human groups based on supposed biological traits is a recurring theme. 
Gould discusses figures like Cesare Lombroso, the criminal anthropologist, who claimed criminals were biological atavisms, throwbacks identifiable by physical features, often compared to inferior races. It's all rooted in biological determinism. And Goddard, before his later shift, extended this idea of innate deficiency really broadly. Oh, yes. Goddard initially linked feeble-mindedness, which he saw as a single inherent defect measured by IQ, to virtually all social problems. Yeah. Crime, poverty, prostitution, alcoholism. It was a simple, albeit terrifyingly wrong, explanation. Then came Lewis Terman, who really popularized IQ testing in the U.S. Right. Terman adapted Binet's test to create the Stanford Binet, which became the standard IQ test. Unlike Binet, Terman was a strong hereditarian. He believed IQ measured fixed innate intelligence and actively marketed the test for sorting individuals in schools and workplaces. Didn't he have specific ideas about IQ levels needed for jobs? Yes. Terman had quite rigid views, suggesting specific IQ thresholds necessary for success in various professions, reinforcing a kind of intellectual caste system. We touched on the army tests, but their use to push immigration quotas in the U.S. seems particularly significant. It was. The flawed results, showing lower scores for Southern and Eastern European immigrants, were seized upon by eugenicists and anti-immigration politicians. They were presented in Congress as scientific proof that these groups were intellectually inferior and shouldn't be allowed into the country in large numbers, directly influencing the Restrictive Immigration Act of 1924. It's important, though, to circle back and remember Binet's original, more positive intention. Definitely. Alfred Binet, who developed the very first practical intelligence test, did so for a specific humane purpose, yeah. identifying children in French schools who needed extra help. He explicitly warned against using his test to measure some fixed innate quantity or to label children permanently. And even Goddard eventually softened his stance. Yes. Later in his career, Goddard acknowledged that feeble-mindedness wasn't necessarily incurable and that environmental factors played a significant role. He moved away from advocating universal segregation. Which underscores the importance of environment and the potential for change. Absolutely. While few would deny genetics plays some role in cognitive abilities, the history we've discussed is a stark warning against deterministic views that ignore environmental influence, education, and the sheer complexity and malleability of human intelligence. You also mentioned neotony as a different perspective. Right. The idea of the neotony, proposed by Louis Bolk, suggests humans evolved by retaining juvenile features of our primate ancestors into adulthood. Things like a relatively large brain, lack of body hair, flat face. It's this delayed development that allows for our extended period of learning and flexibility. A different way to think about human uniqueness beyond simple ranking. And if listeners find these kinds of explorations into biological and psychological ideas interesting, the AI audiobook analysis channel Mindful Moments and our podcasts on YouTube often touches on similar complex topics, encouraging that kind of critical thought. It's also worth remembering that even seemingly simple traits aren't simple genetically. Good point. Take skin color. It's not one gene. It's many genes interacting with the environment, like sun exposure. It's polygenic. Intelligence is vastly more complex than skin color, so imagining it's controlled by a few key genes or represented by one number is, well, naive. And the actual genetic differences between human groups are small? Surprisingly small. Richard Lewontin's famous research in the 1970s showed that most genetic variation exists within any given population group, like within Caucasians or within Asians, not between them. The biological basis for distinct races, in genetic terms, is very weak. So pulling this all together, what are the main takeaways for our listeners from this dive into the mismeasure of man? I think the biggest takeaway is that the attempt to capture intelligence as a single, fixed, innate number is a story riddled with errors, biases, and devastating social consequences. Intelligence is almost certainly multifaceted, dynamic, and shaped by an intricate dance between nature and nurture. It makes you wonder, why are we so drawn to simple rankings, to single numbers, especially when dealing with something as complex as human potential? That's a great question to ponder. Maybe it offers a false sense of order or predictability. But the danger lies in reducing individuals, limiting opportunities, and justifying inequality based on flawed metrics. We need better ways to understand and nurture human capabilities. Definitely food for thought. If you found this exploration valuable, please subscribe to keep digging into complex topics with us. Share it with friends you think would find it thought-provoking. And if you want to delve deeper into Gould's arguments yourself, you can find a link to purchase The Mismeasure of Man in our show notes. 
Buying through the link also helps support our work. Most importantly, keep thinking critically. Question the numbers, question the rankings, and always look for the underlying assumptions.